Hello, lovely squirrels. I tell you what, I love to hear the Scottish speak and British folk and, you know, their accent, their brogue, the Scottish brogue, and even the, the Irish. And you used to be able to tell the difference between the Irish and the Scottish. There is a difference. But reading this, me being an old country gal, I... <laughs> it's going to be interesting. I'm tripping over these words. And I don't even remember exactly, and I usually go back and look, but I didn't. Exactly where I finished up last... Whenever it was. Was it last night? You know I got sleepy. You know it. So I may be repeating something. I don't think I'll be leaving anything out. I believe we were at... Um, where they... Uh, what is the gal's name that looks after? Effie? Is this Galbraith? Galbraith, Gabe, Gil, Galbraith, and Effie. Uh, it, he was, um, somebody had told him, I guess, he had a good, the child had a good memory, and his dad said, you know, don't be telling him ghostly stories, and old wives tales and stuff like that and then they were well I'll just start here like I say I may be repeating when Sandy was seven years of age a lean and overgrown child without his front teeth and any comeliness he might possess existed only in his mother's eyes a strange circumstance happened that greatly perplexed and distressed his parents. One cold afternoon late in October, Mrs. Gale, Gay, how do I say this name? Gabrith told Effie to take a pudding and a can of broth to an old and very poor woman called Elspeth McPhee, who lived in a long cottage. I think I read this. A mile from the farm, and Sandy was to go with her for the sake of a walk. The trees were already stripped by the autumn gales, yeah, I remember reading this, to which a dead calm succeeded in a cold fog had crept up from the sea and brooded over the bare fields, settling on the naked boughs and chilly drops of moisture. The careful mother wrapped a plaid round the boy and bade him run as he went to keep himself warm. Away sped Sandy along the high road, driving a ball before him and running after it, sent it flying again with a dexterous blow of his stick till his pale cheeks, cheeks glowed with exercise, and he overshot his mark, ran past old Elspeth's cottage, and had to be recalled by Effie. Yaman put the basket in her hand, your aunt, your Ansel, she said, as she led the reluctant child into the dark, into the dark close room where the old woman sat shivering by the fire, spreading her skinny hands over the dying embers. But Sandy held back. Neither threatening nor coaxing would induce him to move a step nearer to Elspeth. So that stigmatizing him as a dour limb, Effie was obliged to set the basket on the table herself. It's just a pudding and a few broth that Miss that Mistress Galbraith has sent you, for she's I, for she's I mindful of the, of the pure, pure, pure for the poor. She said as she set out the can and bowl for the old woman, Elspeth looked with a bitter smile at the good things spread before her. It's a very, very good so far as it goes, but gin I'd been the rich body in Mistress Galbraith, the poor Car Carling, I would have sent her a, mu a mutchkin, a something stranger than mutton, mutton broth does she no warm her 
warm her own, her ain, thrapple with a dr with a drap of whiskey herself, whiskey. For shame, Elspeth, you mind just talk what sent ye and be grateful," said Effie sharply, and turned to Sandy, who stood gazing intently at the old woman. What ails the barn that he cannot take his eyes off your face? It's not it's no your beauty, I'm thinking, Elspeth, that draws him so. The ill favored old woman cackled to herself, displaying a few yellow tusks, the last survivors of a set of teeth that had once been as white and strong as Effie's. It's lying since man or ba bairn. I guess that's how I should be saying it. Looked at all Elspeth with sick a gaze. What does the bairn see in an odd wife's face? You should look at the lassie, Sandy lad, and Elspeth stretched out her lean arm, caught the boy by the wrist, and drew him towards her. She was a hideous old woman. And in the gathering twilight, when the red glare of the embers shed a glow on her harsh features, Uh, harsh features. She appeared positively witch-like. Sandy suffered himself to be drawn close to her as one who walks in his sleep with wide-open eyes, void of expression, and then stood opposite her for a moment, pale and silent. Before either of the women could speak, the child's voice was heard. What for had you bobbies on your in, Elspeth McPhee? And he means coins on her eyes and a white cloth lap it under your chin a white cloth old elspeth dropped sandy's hand and sank back with a groan effie effie hark to him the bairn has a second sight and he sees me strick it for the grave ay and you'll all see it see it soon I feel the malls upon me already. Take him away, take him away. He's an awesome bairn. And Sandy quietly put on his cap and went out into the cold mist. Effie followed him and relieved her fright and agitation by speaking sharply to the child. For shame of yourself, Sandy, to fright an old woman with gruesome words that ye never heard from your mither nor me. But what for should Elspeth be frightened? There were bobbies on her in, and a white cloth around her head. And I just taught, and I just taught her about it. And gin I see the like of it on your face, Effie, I'll tell ye. My certie, but you'll be brent for a warlock gin you read folks' deaths on their faces, and you'd best hold your clavers. Hold your tongue, I guess. And Effie said no more, but thought much on her way back to the farm. She was sure that Sandy did not know the meaning of his own words. He'd never seen a dead body, and he did not know how a corpse is prepared for the grave, and he certainly had no information on the subject from books, for he could not read. And the appearance he described on old Elspeth's face did not seem to frighten him. He had gazed at her from the moment in which they entered the cottage till they left it, but with wonder and interest rather than fear. The fright was for Elspeth, Elspeth McPhee herself, and as she watched the child, unconscious of the death wound he had given, bounding along the road, still playing with his ball and stick, Effie shuddered with vague and nameless fears. That night at supper, Effie told her fellow servants of Sandy's weird words, and they took counsel together whether his mother should be told about it or not, and they decided only to speak to her if anything untoward happened to old Elspeth. It was on Thursday that Effie had been sent to Elspeth McPhee's cottage, and she resolved to go there again on her own account on the following Sunday afternoon. Her native superstitions were strong upon her, though she had never imparted them to her young charge, and she drew near to Elspeth's cottage with a boding heart. It scarcely surprised her when she entered to find old Elspeth lying dead on the bed, 
with coins on her eyes and a white cloth bound round her head, precisely as Sandy had seen her on Thursday. Two women were in the room with the dead, eager to tell how Elspeth had taken to her bed on Thursday evening, refused bit or sup, and had died early that morning. Effie trembled but merely asked of what all Elspeth had died for three days before she seemed in no likelihood of death. But the only account the women could give of her sudden death was that she appeared to have had no illness at all, and that she had said, I'm no a sick woman, but a dying, and, I, and I'm on gay. Must go. Effie hastened home to tell her mistress everything, repeating faithfully every word that old Elspeth and Sandy had said on the previous Thursday, and Mrs. Galbraith listened while, with a white and awestruck face. You'll just say nothing about it, Effie. It'll be a sair prejudice against the poor bairn, and stand in his way again, folks think Sandy has a second sight, and Effie did not think it necessary to mention that every servant in the house was acquainted with the result of her visit to old Elspeth's cottage, but she hinted that if she continued to wait on such an awesome bairn that might see the death tokens on her face any day and fright her into an early grave, her wages should be raised in proportion to the danger of her service. When Mrs. Galbraith told her husband of Sandy's ghastly remark, its tragic result in the child's unconsciousness in the matter, he disguised the fears that possessed him beneath a bluster of wrath and rated, and then it says rated is a word that means rebuked here. Uh, rated her and Effie soundly. It stands to reason that the Baron cannot speak of what he does know, not ken, and you and Effie, but mare likely Effie than you, for I was used to think you a woman a sense, have been telling Sandy all the wives' tales about the second sight till he thinks it a fine thing to practice what you've taught him, and the and the all doitered fuel Elspeth dies out of sheer fright in consequence, and you mun see for your own self that your own folly has brought about. But Mrs. Galbraith protested that neither she nor Effie had ever uttered a word about the second sight in the boy's hearing, and David, who in his heart believeth believed his wife, though he did not deem it consistent with his dignity to own as much, abruptly ended the unpleasant affair by saying peremptorily, I'll no permit the bairn to be taught any my, any my ungodly superstitions and old wives' tales. Effie may gang to the dale, and Sandy shall be with me in his walks and rides, and I'll, and I'll s warrant you'll hear nothing from him but what he learns from me, good sense and sound doctrine. And Effie was dismissed to her own great relief, and from that day forth, Sandy became his father's outdoor companion to the visible benefit of his health and spirits. But no one was so really alarmed at Sandy's uncanny remark and its consequences as David Galbraith himself. His grandmother, a Highland woman, had had the second sight, and his father had told him how she lived to become the terror of her family. Her premonitions of death and calamity were unfailingly true and the spirit within her never enlightened her as to how the impending evil might be averted. She was simply the medium of announcing approaching doom. What if her ghostly gift had descended to her grandson, a barren heritage that would make him shunned by his kind? Poor Allison Galbraith, finding her husband irritable, and unreasonable on the subject of Sandy's weird speech, 
sought comfort in pouring out her fears to, to their minister, the Reverend Ewan McFarlane, who gave ear to her with as much patience as could be expected from a man whose chief business it was in life to speak and not to listen. He drew the very worst inference from what he heard. It's a clear case of the second sight, and I cannot and I cannot but fear that there may be more to come. When the uncanny spirit lights on a body, there's nay predicting what its manifestation may be. And for all that we can, it may be you or me that Sandy will see the death tokens on ne next. I guess this is ne ne next. And if you continue to bring him to the Kirk, I guess church, I would request that you'll no let him sit glowering at me. <laughs> For though sudden death would doubtless be sudden glory to me, it would no be consistent with the dignity of a minister of the free Kirk that he should be harried untimely into his grave by an uncanny bairn. That would he been burnt for a warlock in times gained by, and if I was spared such a sayer visitation, the bairn might yet be permitted to work a certain perturbation of spirit in me that would cause me to curtail the word of God and bring my discourse to a premature end, to the grievous loss of them that hear. And Mistress Galbraith, let me tell you, tell ye, you, f you fall into disrepute with your neighbors gin Sandy sees bobbies on your minister's honored aim, and ought came of it, and ought came of it to his prejudice. In the following spring, David Gilbreth's younger brother Colin returned after an absence of ten years to spend a few months with his relations in Scotland. Okay, youngest brother Colin, okay. Uh, his industry had been prospered in Australia, and he was in a better position than he could have attained by any exertions of his own in the old country. He and his nephew struck up a warm friendship together, and it was a pretty sight to see them golfing on the links at North Ber Berwick. The strong man accommodating, accommodating his play to that of the puny boy by his side and restraining his speech so that not a word fell from his lips but what was fit for a child to hear. One day when they had first when they had played till Sandy was tired, they sauntered down to the beach. Uncle Colin to sit on the rock smoking his morning pipe, his nephew to perch beside him, and amuse himself with the shells and seaweed that abound there. Presently, Sandy grew weary of sitting still, threw away the handful of shells he had picked up, and proposed they should go farther along the sands to where the children were bathing. And give me your hand, Uncle Colin, and I'll tell you something while we walk that I cannot just, I cannot just understand myself. I've seen an Unco strange thing, I've seen your house in Australia. Hoot, mon, what havers are you talking? You been dreaming? Hoot, mon, <laughs> said Uncle Con Con Colin cheerily. Nay, I saw it. It was no dream. I can wield the difference between dreaming and seeing. Your house has nay slats on the roof like our house. It was thicket like a hayrick, and it had a wide place round it covered with another little thicket roof, and windows like big glass doors opened on it, and there was fire all about, and tall grass all ablaze, and sheep running hither and thither frighted, 
and a man with a black beard and his gun in his hand ran out of the house and shouted, Oh, Grady, save the mare and foal. If they've lost the, if they're lost, the master will ne'er forget, forgive ye. What ails ye, Uncle Colin, that ye look so white? And the boy looked up in his uncle's face with wonder. It's no canny to see such a sight, Sandy. What do you ken of bush fires? I guess what do you know? And you've never seen a picture of my house. And who taught you that my groom is an Irishman named O'Grady? For I've told no nobody here, and the man with the black beard is my Scottish shepherd. There was no need to tell me anything about it, Uncle Colin, for I saw it. For I saw it as something, the words go. But if the man at the door hadn't a shouted O'Grady, then I shouldn't have hey, kinned his name. Should not have known his name. Colin made a poor attempt at laughter, but he might hide from the child how shocked and startled he was. But as soon as they reached home, he told his brother about his son's wisdom, no vision, and heard from him in return the story of Sandy and old Elspeth. A few days later, Colin Galbraith received a telegram from his head shepherd informing him of the heavy loss he had just sustained from a very serious bushfire and both he and David were convinced that Sandy was an uncanny bairn. And I'll stop right there. Pretty good, huh? If I could read it. I wish I had the dialect. It's not a whole, whole lot more, but We'll get to it next reading. Okay. Y'all have a nice night and sleep well and hope to see you tomorrow at Three Bells and Sunday also. And remember that I'm back to giveaways on Sundays. Probably another mystery one. Love y'all. Night-night. Be sweet. Don't be ugly.